you find this in Revelation chapter 7 and in Revelation 14. I'm going to start out just reading from Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So there's pictured there in Revelation 7, these four angels holding back the winds of strife. Why four angels? The Bible says the Lord sends his angels to the four corners of the earth. Those four angels represent, it's a universal, north, south, east, west. It's talking about a universal protection. They're holding back catastrophe. I'm talking about mammoth, colossal catastrophe from happening in the world on an epic scale until something happens. That something is the servants of God are being sealed in their forehead. Then it goes on and it says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So first maybe we ought to talk about of the tribes of Israel. Is it talking here in Revelation about 144,000 literal Jews? Now I win either way because I, I can claim either identity. But uh, is it speaking of literal Jews being sealed? Let me read some scriptures to you about that. Paul said, a Jew, he said in Romans chapter 2 verse 28, Paul the Apostle, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor a circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and that circumcision is of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter. Now I do believe God has a special work for the Jewish people in the last days. But the 144,000, there's several reasons I don't believe it's literal Jews. I think that they are, it may include some literal Jews, but it's spiritual Jews. The Bible says if you are Christ's then you are Abraham's seed. And even John the Baptist said, do not think to say within yourself that we are children of Abraham. He said, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from the stones. Jesus said, many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, fathers of the Jewish nation. And the children of the kingdom will be in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So once the Holy Spirit was poured out, the gospel really goes to everyone. Everyone who accepts Jesus becomes a spiritual Jew. How many believe they're saved under the New Covenant? Christians are saved under the New Covenant, not the Old Covenant, New Covenant. I do too. Let me quote the New Covenant. I will make a New Covenant with the house of Israel after those days. Only people saved in the New Covenant are Jews. So you need to be a spiritual Jew. Another reason I don't think it's a literal Jew that it's speaking of, or at least restricted to only literal Jews, First of all, 2,000 years from Christ, you probably all have a little Jewish blood in you. Till 1948, they were scattered all over the world, weren't they? And so all of you probably have a little bit of wandering Jew in you. <laughs> you also look at the list of tribes that are mentioned here. It is unique from any other list given in the Bible. A different order and different tribes are mentioned. I don't have time to go into it, but there are actually 13 tribes. The reason they keep talking about 12 tribes is because the tribe of Levi, they were priests for the other 12. Joseph, he, his children, Ephraim and Manasseh, they each got credit for being an individual tribe, so it kept the number 13. Judah was not the firstborn, Reuben was, but here it lists Judah first. And it says, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh. You add up what the names mean. Every Jewish name meant something. Here's the key to understanding the 144,000 and the list of names that are given. You read in Genesis, when each of those baby boys were born, the mothers made a declaration regarding their name. Judah was born and Leah said, I will praise the Lord. That's what Judah means, praise. Reuben was born, he has looked on me. So forth. And then of course you've got the other six. Simeon, God hears me, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and the definitions. You can do this study on your own. You still with me? Each name has a meaning. The name Emmanuel, for instance, means God with us. The name Jesus means 
Savior. Every name in Hebrew meant something. It, it had a meaning to it. You line up the meanings of the names in the 144,000, and this is what it says. I will praise the Lord, for he has looked on me and granted good fortune. I am happy because my wrestling God is making me to forget. God hears me and is attached or married to me. He has purchased me a dwelling and will add to me the son of his right hand. Isn't that amazing? That's, it's the whole story of salvation encapsulated in the names of the 144,000. By the way, the tribe of Dan is left out and the tribe of Ephraim. And it's got 12 there because it adds Levi and Joseph in their place. Uh, those of you who've been reading your Bible for a few years know what I was just saying. Sorry, I, didn't, I, I don't want to be condescending, but sometimes I try and give a little milk and a little meat and mix it up together. It goes on to say about the 144,000, they have a special name in their foreheads. Now, that name represents the seal of God. You can read in Exodus 13, verse 9, it says, speaking of the law of God, it shall be a sign unto you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. Between your eyes in the Hebrew mind meant in your thoughts as a man thinketh in his heart. They, you think with your mind, not with your pump. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And it means they've got the Father's name in their mind, in their worship. It says that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. I'm finishing the verse there in Exodus Again, you read in Isaiah 8, 16, seal the law among my disciples. All right, so the 144,000 must be sealed with their father's name in their forehead. And then it says in Isaiah, the seal is the law of God. Seal the law among my disciples. They got the law in their minds, in their hearts. That's simple enough. Those who love the Lord obey the Lord, right? Jesus said, if you love me. But a seal is more than that. All seals have at least three components. We've talked about this, but I know you can't all make it every night. First of all, it'll have a name. It'll have the official title in the territory of the office. And so it would be, is it Kevin Runt? Prime Minister, Australia. You got, you got the name, you get the office, you get the territory. For us, it would be Barack Obama, President, United States. All the kings in the Bible, they had an official seal. Pontius Pilate put a seal on the tomb of Jesus. Darius put a seal on the lion's den. So they all had these seals. Ahasuerus sealed the documents for Esther. And they all said, Ahasuerus, King Medo-Persia. You find the seal of God in the law of God. The one commandment with the word, remember, in the middle of God's law is where you find that seal. Exodus 20. Verse 11 in the Ten Commandments. Four and six days, the Lord, there's his name, created or made, that's his title, the heavens and the earth. That's everything up here, up there and down here. That's his territory. Right there in that commandment, you have the essence of worship, the law of God, the seal of God, his name, his office, his territory, much more important than many people think. And then it goes on to say, and after these things, we're still just doing our introduction to the 144,000. I want to tell you who they are in a moment. Are they the only ones saved? Some thought, boy, over almost 7 billion people in the world today, if only 144,000 are saved, my chances are about 1 in 40,000. Boy, you may as well play the lottery, right? <laughs> Have better chances of getting struck by lightning. No, that's not the only one saved. They're a special group that is also saved. It says, after these things, look and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every tribe that's being saved. So who are the 144,000? They are a unique group. I'm going to tell you very quickly. They represent the apostles in the last days. Let me take you also now to Revelation 14. We'll get a few more clues. Revelation 14, verse 1 also talks about them. I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having their father's name written in their foreheads. It says, these are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Oh, does that mean that all of the 144,000 are girls? Remember Bible symbols? What does a woman represent? 
Is there an unfaithful woman in Revelation 17 that's called an adulteress? So the 144,000 are not defiled with Babylon and her daughters, for they are holy. That's all it's saying. By the way, that can include everybody here. I love the story of Mary Magdalene. I actually wrote a book on Mary Magdalene. She had a terrible reputation. By the time Jesus got done with her, he cast out seven devils, and she was the first one to see the resurrection. Treated her like a virgin. Treated her as holy. Told her the good news that he was alive. She was the first one that got that news. So the Lord can take you, no matter how sordid your past might be, he can clean you up and make you a spiritual virgin. You know what I'm saying? The apostles also had some pretty motley backgrounds. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He forgives us and gives us a new beginning. They represent the last day apostles. Jesus used 12 apostles to preach the gospel at his first coming to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Before his second coming, he's going to have 12 times 12,000. Well, by the way, in the Bible, if you look in 1 Chronicles 27, that whole chapter tells about the, the army of David, his militia that was always on duty. Every month, he had 24,000 soldiers on call, 12 times a year, total of 288,000. What's half of 288,000? 144,000. Well, that's because, some have argued, that's because they were on 12-hour shifts, 144,000 for first shift, 144,000 for second shift. Some have said, no, it was 144,000 for the northern kingdom, 144,000 for the southern kingdom. But you can look that up. That's in 1 Chronicles chapter 27. The whole chapter num numbers his militia there and who their officers were. And it says, these are they that follow the lamb wherever he goes. Who are the 12 that followed the lamb wherever he went on earth? When Jesus walked the earth, it's the apostles. And he goes on to say, these were redeemed from among men being the first fruits of the lamb. Who was the trophy of the first ones that Jesus called the apostles? Who were the first ones to receive the great commission? Who ate the last supper with them? They got the new covenant first. Who were the first ones to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The 12 were always central to that. They're the ones. And then it goes on to say they have special robes. They're wearing these white robes. And Christ said that the apostles would sit governing the 12 tribes with him. Well, before we get into our questions, I'll give you a little amazing fact. Have you ever heard of Joseph Lister? Joseph Lister. Medical history is sort of dated before and after Lister. Lister was a, a doctor that lived in the 1860s, and this is back during a time when there was a great deal of people dying in the hospitals because they did not understand the spread of germs. Matter of fact, 50% of the people that underwent surgery died. Now, you've ever heard the expression, the surgery was a success, but the patient died anyway. Uh, that came out of that time where they, everything went fine with the surgery, but they didn't realize they, they would go from one operating theater to another with the blood still on their hands. And they didn't wash, and they'd use the same instruments without cleaning them. I mean, just abominable conditions. Matter of fact, 80% of the women that went to hospitals that had babies back then either died or had got a serious infection. It was terrible. Lister was a very devout Christian. He read about the laws of contagion and cleanliness and washing in the Bible. Moses talked about if you've talked, touched something unclean, wash. Very simple sanitation. And he was convinced from that and also the studies of Louis Pasteur that disease was being spread by these microscopic germs. And he became a fanatic for cleanliness and he started a clinic. And all the other doctors mocked him. They called him crazy. They called him a fanatic. They said, oh, you're afraid of these phantom germs. They don't exist. But they started looking and 90% of the people in his clinic were getting better in healing. Phenomenally better statistics. Gradually, he survived all of the ridicule and they began to realize he was right and started adopting the sanitation methods of, of Lister. You ever heard of that mouthwash called Listerine? It's named after him, it's supposed to kill all the germs. He understood that there are germs out there and they're deadly and you gotta be careful. We all know that today. Well, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some spiritual germs tonight. So I thought I'd throw that amazing fact in. How can you be among the 144,000 or at least that great multitude in the last of days that will be ready for the Lord's coming? He's calling us to live holy lives. 
let's find out what the Bible teaches about this. Now, I'm going to be sharing things with you that may not be popular, and you don't, you don't hear them very much anymore. But um, they're biblical. And my mandate from the Lord is to preach the word, whether it's popular or not. I'll do it my best to make it as attractive as possible, but I need to be faithful to tell you what the Bible says. Do you want to know the truth? Yeah, you say that now. You haven't heard what I'm going to say yet. <laughs> you, I hope you really want to know the truth. First of all, a little background. Who is, let me read this again. Who is the author of Scripture? And it says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. So the teachings of the Bible are not Doug's teachings. They're the teachings of Jesus. And again, Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have everlasting life, but these are they that testify of me. The scriptures are really telling us about Jesus. It's his book. He is called the Word incarnate. Number two, what is Jesus' attitude towards the people of the earth? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wouldn't you like everlasting life? He's offering that to you. He so loves the world. God gave His Son. What could you give more than your child? What's the most valuable thing you've got? You know, they often say, well, if your house is on fire, what are you going to grab and run? People usually say, get your pictures. I'm always surprised people say, get your pictures, and they don't say, well, get the kids first. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, but you'll have pictures of the kids. You don't need them. Just get the pictures. <laughs> well, first you get your kids. Then you go back for the photographs, right? God so loved the world, he gave the most valuable thing. He emptied heaven. When the creator dies for the creation, what more could he give? He loves us desperately. But he knows that sin is lethal. And he wants to save us, not in our sin, but from our sin. That's what the angel said. He didn't say to Mary, he's going to save them with their sin or in their sin. It says they'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Sin is our problems. You just look at the major problems in our life, it's usually connected with sin in some way or other. Ours or someone else's. Number three, why should we love Jesus? We love him because he first loved us. You know, it's a lot easier for me to love you after I love Jesus. And when I think that uh, people are sometimes unkind or annoying and you become irritated with people, when I stand at the foot of the cross and I see Jesus hanging there for Doug Batchelor's sins, it's hard for me to be very critical of your sins. It's a little easier for me to love and forgive you when I see how much God loves and forgives me. God loves us even while we're sinners. I mean, it's easy for us to love the nice people. It's a little harder to love the cantankerous ones. You know one reason God wants us to join a church? It's not because that's where all the saints are. It's because it's a gymnasium where you learn to love. Do you think that everybody in the church is lovable? That's no problem at all. You don't get muscles by lifting feathers, lifting feathers up. You get muscles by lifting weight. And if you say, Lord, give me more love, you know what he'll do? He'll put you around some people that will challenge your love muscles. <laughs> if you say, Lord, give me patience, do you think he's going to give you a pill and you're going to take it and all of a sudden you'll have infinite patience? Or does he give you delay? <laughs> and then you develop patience. You see, that's how, that's how real life works. And if you say, Lord, give me love, he'll put you around, he'll give you some kids that'll challenge you, and you'll still love them. He'll put you around some family. You know, you really learn to love at home. That's where you really get challenged. That's where you take all that friendly fire from the people around you. I think it's interesting in the Bible, it says, love your enemies, and then it says, love your neighbors. That's usually because your biggest enemies are your neighbors. <laughs> and a neighbor is a nigh brother. Isn't that how it works? But do you still need to join a church? Yeah, because that's where we learn to love. Does Jesus love the church? Or does he only love the good people in the church that walk around with halos? Or does the Lord love sinners? Yeah, he loves you. He loves you right now, who you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. That's why he wants to save us from our sins. We love him because he first loved us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came into the world and 
knowing that we're sinners, knowing that most would not accept, and he still came because he loves us desperately. Number four, in what respect are a successful marriage and the Christian life similar? By the way, we've got a special additional lesson we're going to give you tomorrow on marriage that I think you'll enjoy. Very practical information. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, when two people stand before the pastor and they take those vows, and uh, it's interesting, the restrictions of marriage. I assume it's similar here as it is back in the States where you say, I promise to love and sickness and health, the honor to cherish, forsaking all others. That's pretty restrictive, isn't it? I mean, you've kind of been, you know, surfing the market and all of a sudden you get married and you say, forsaking all others. Keep yourself solely unto him or her as long as you both shall live. They're making these incredible vows and at least in our country, as soon as he says, I do, he just gave her 50% of his property. <laughs> and he's still smiling after that. Why? All those laws are suddenly take effect because of love. When people love, they're willing to sacrifice. They're willing to dedicate. They're willing to deny themselves because they love. And then the mother gets that, the wife gets that twinkle in her eye and she says, I want a baby. Yeah. Why? The husband says, now, because I want, I want the baby to love me. <laughs> I want love. <laughs> and I want to love the baby. And I don't think too many mothers realize when they start out that a baby is about the most selfish creature in the world. <laughs> and they're cute for a little while, but you know, in the middle of the night when you've had a long day and they wake up, and you lean over the bassinet and say, could you please go to sleep because mommy's tired. They couldn't care less how tired you are. All they know is that they're hungry or bored or they got a plumbing problem and they want their, your attention. You got to teach them to love. It doesn't come natural. Love doesn't come natural for most of us. We got to learn it. You got to teach your children to love. You got to teach them selflessness. We're naturally selfish. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's a discipline that we learn to love him. A lot of people misunderstand this and they say, okay, Lord, I'm going to give my heart to you. And they wait for some kind of pink mashed potatoes to fall on them and make them love him. It doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit does give you a gift of love, but it works with your choice to surrender your will to God. As you surrender your mind and your heart to God and you draw near to God, you read in James chapter 4, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. <coughs> Every step you take closer to God, he draws near to you. Do you know the story of the prodigal son in the Bible? Luke chapter 15, as soon as that father saw his son coming home, he ran to meet him. As soon as God sees you drawing near to him, and you're coming to these meetings, you're drawing near to him. You're making an effort to learn. He will draw near to you. I hope you come to the follow-up meetings. You'll still be drawing near to him, and he'll still be drawing near to you. Don't stop coming to the Lord. Jesus says, come unto me. That's not a one-time event. It's an everyday event. You're born again every day. You need to be, because Paul said, I die daily. And if you die every day and you're not born every day, that means you're more dead than alive, right? At least that's my caveman logic. So you got to be born again every day. Number five, what does Jesus say are the results of doing the things that please him. Answer, these are from the scriptures, John 15, 11. These things I've spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. It is the greatest myth the devil has ever hypnotized the world with, that if you come to Jesus, you stop having fun. You don't ever really start living until you come to Jesus. And I, sometimes I talk to young people at colleges and in schools and they think, well, I'd like to come to Jesus, but you know, then I can't have any more fun. I think you ought to follow Pastor Doug around for a while. I have a lot of fun. I kayak and I do photography and I go skydiving and I fly planes and I scuba dive and you can't keep up with me. Then you can have so much fun as a Christian and you don't have a hangover. <laughs> That's the wonderful thing about it. People have fun the devil's way and they drink and they get sick and then they spend the next day worshiping that porcelain pony in the bathroom and, <laughs> and it's just that, that, not fun. Sorry, I don't think I've ever said that before. <laughs> Number six. I, did I mention I used drugs when I was younger? Sometimes the wires get crossed. <laughs> Why does Jesus give us specific principles for Christian living? 
There's rules in the Christian life. Why? Because he loves us for our protection. If you're a parent, do you have rules? I mean, what would happen if all of a sudden all of the military and the police resigned at the same time in your country? The criminals would begin to breed like cancer. There'd be chaos. Other nations would move in and take over. The reason you enjoy freedom and some kind of semblance of order in your life is because of the law. It's because there is self-control. I was in uh, New York City with a friend one day and he snapped, some of you know John Lomacain from the three ABN television programs, and he gave me this picture. We grew up in New York City. The subway in New York. These are just a handful of the rules for riding a train, and I bet you've got them posted somewhere in your system here in Sydney. And it tells you about you know, how loud your music can be and how you're supposed to sit, and you can't take more than one chair, and you can't carry a package too big because other people can't get off and on the train. they got all these rules. Are they legalists? No, 99% of the people that ride the subway are glad there are rules that you're not supposed to walk up the tracks through the tunnels. It's one of the rules. I don't think you can see them all. That makes sense. That would slow everybody down, right? And the Lord God, why did God give us rules? And the Lord God commanded us to observe all these statutes, Deuteronomy 6.24, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive. God says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all of my commandments always that it might be well with them and their children forever. God wants it to be well with us. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have an abundant life. Always. So the laws of God are not there to restrict our freedom. It's to preserve our freedom. question is, do you trust Him? You know, with our kids. I, like I said, we've had six children, and all of them along the way we said, don't play in the street. Don't ride your bike out in the traffic. I remember one time when uh, I did mission work on a Navajo Indian reservation for about a year and a half, and uh, one of our uh, sons, Daniel, um, he was, oh, about four or five years old at the time, and he had a new bike with the training wheels, very dangerous road right in front of our uh, mission station there. A lot of people speeding by. It was a highway. And we had a long dirt driveway and we said, don't ever go out onto the street. But he didn't want to ride around in the dirt, you know? And he kept thinking, oh, it would be so much more fun to ride my bike on the pavement. And I said, don't ever do this. You're in big trouble if you do. Don't. But I knew he kind of had a mind of his own. One day I was out raking the yard and I heard cars honking. And I looked out in the road and there was my little five-year-old boy in the middle of the road riding around. These cars are zinging by. And they're not slowing down and telling them to get out of the road. They're just honking and driving around them. And my heart froze. And I ran so fast out there and, and he was kind of oblivious. And soon he saw me coming. He looked pretty scared. <laughs> and we just bought him this bike. And I snatched him up in one arm and grabbed his little bike in the other arm and I ran out of the highway and cars are going by. I took his bike and I just threw it as far as I could. Then he was really scared. <laughs> then I took him in the house. I said, Daniel, you and Daddy are going to pray. So I prayed and I said, oh dear Lord, thank you so much that you watched over Daniel and you protected him and he's alive so I can spank him. <laughs> He never did that again. <laughs> now, did I do that because I didn't love him? Because I was trying to restrict his freedom or because I did love him? God's rules are to keep us alive, eternally alive. That's the important part. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to you, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Jesus not only came to die for our sins, he said, look, I've given you an example. So whenever you're in doubt about some behavior, what's right or what's wrong, do what Jesus did. That's, you're always safe if you just do what Jesus did, friends. Does that make sense? He's our example. And it's not meaning you've got to wear a white robe and go around barefoot or in sandals. That's not the part we're talking about. It's talking about his life. 
a life of love, a life of service. How many times was Jesus tempted by the devil? Three temptations. I'm talking about in the wilderness when Satan met him. There were three primary temptations. He said, turn these stones into bread. And he said, uh, cast yourself off the temple. And then he said, bow down and worship me. Do you know there were three primary temptations for Eve at the tree? And they appealed to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It was a food that smelled good, desirable for food. It was attractive. And he promised you'll be like God if you eat it. All those same features were in that one temptation for Eve. And the world is passing away in the lust thereof. Don't live for the lusts of the world. It won't bring you happiness. But he that does the will of God will abide forever. How many want to abide forever? Then you can't live like the world. The world cannot be your compass. The world cannot be your standard. Jesus must be your standard. You are going to be like an alien in the world if you are a real Christian. Because after all, you, a citizen, you become a citizen of another country when you're Christian. You are looking for another kingdom. Number eight, what urgent warnings does God give us regarding the world? Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Speaking of the worldliness, the sinfulness in the world, the compromises. And again, he said in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, verse 17 of chapter 6, Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. That doesn't mean that we're supposed to go into space when he says be separate. I just threw that picture in there because it gives you the idea. But we do, to some extent, live in a different atmosphere. You know, they've got these spiders in Asia that live underwater. They don't breathe like fish. They have to breathe air just like you and me. So what they do is they take little bubbles down constantly. Every day they need fresh supply of air. They take bubbles down. They build a nest. Uh, the web makes sort of a, uh, a, a nest that catches the bubbles into a big bell. And the spider lives and breathes and eats in that bell underwater. But it has to keep going back for fresh air all the time to keep the atmosphere renewed. It's kind of like a Christian. We live down here by virtue of an atmosphere we get through prayer above. And we need to keep a fresh supply. Otherwise you won't make it. You got to be praying. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Only way you can keep your mind focused on spiritual things. It says, and touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you. Christ will clean us, he'll transform us, and then he wants us to live in a way separate. Now it's a challenge because Christians are kind of like a boat. We're in the world and that's exactly where a boat belongs, but you don't want the water in the boat. A boat belongs in the water, but you don't want the water in the boat or it sinks. Christians have to learn how to be in the world, but not the world in us. And that's the big challenge. Again, Paul says, Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to prove. That means test, evaluate. And so being a Christian is not just one big sloppy decision. It's a day-by-day a challenge. It's an exercise of faith and you are going to have to be weighing options and using judgment and making decisions based on the Holy Spirit, the criteria of the Bible and the example of Jesus all day long. I don't want to pretend, friends, that you just come forward and you say a prayer and now you're saved and you just go out and live the way you used to live. It requires your hand to be a Christian. The Lord says, come and let us reason together. He's appealing to your gray matter to be a Christian. You've got to use judgment and evaluate what you're doing in the light of eternity every day. Does that make sense? That you might prove, test. Therefore, how do you get the victory? Submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Most of us kind of give in right away. We don't even give the devil a chance to run from us. We capitulate too quick. If you'd resist the devil, you'd find that he gets frustrated. He's impatient. And then you get a little reprieve until the next temptation. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And you've got a, the Bible says, put to death, bury those old ways that you used to live. They're kind of crucified and buried and you become a new creature. Number nine, why do we need to guard our thoughts? 
Well, the most important thing about conversion is how you think. Being a Christian starts right here. It's a new state of mind. You, you think differently. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I jumped ahead here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We not only want the Lord to change our lives, it begins by changing your thinking. Didn't Jesus say, you're not just supposed to not commit adultery, the act. He said, if you look on a woman to lust in your heart, you're committing adultery in your heart. And you realize he means here. And that's men and women can do that. It's not just that you tell a lie. He says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Don't swear by heaven or earth. It's not just that you go out and murder. He said, if you're angry with your brother without cause, you might be committing homicide in your hearts. And so really being changed and converted is a new way of thinking. And that new way of thinking changes everything else in the life. So you got to start with the heart. You start with the mind. Again, here's a verse I quoted a moment ago. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Number 10, what are some of the basic Christian principles uh, what are some of the principles for Christian living? Now we're going to get to some specifics, some practical things where the rubber meets the road. This is what preachers all used to say, but you don't hear it much anymore. Whatsoever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's any praise, think on these things. So I'm challenging you now to think about what you think about. It does matter what you meditate on. Whatever you think about is who you are. It's who you really are. Somebody got into an elevator in New York with Robert Redford, and as the elevator door closed, they looked at him, they looked down, they looked at him, and they said, are you the real Robert Redford? And he said, only when I'm alone. Some people aren't really who they are until they're alone. Now, some of you do pretty good. When you, once you get home, then it's the real you. It's, you can fool the world, but you usually can't fool your family. So it's a change up here. Now, can you have a change in your thinking if people are listening to the typical music and watching the programs that the world typically watches? Has it been getting better, or is it just me? Is it getting worse? Let's talk about music. Is it okay if I talk to you about what kind of music would a Christian listen to? Would I dare venture onto that volatile subject? Does it make a difference? The typical music of the world today, does it pass the criteria of what is good and holy and noble and just and pure? Or is most of it pretty rank? and uh, filled with all kinds of uh, evil suggestions and it's just not getting better. Now music is a very powerful thing because music is really a type of prayer. God, I, God believes in music, he invented it. But every gift of God the devil can abuse. How many of you, let me just, and I don't know if our cameraman, I want to give you a warning, if you guys can get a, an audience shot of this because I'm going to ask you for a show of hands. By show of hands, how many of you would be willing to agree right now that there is some music that is bad or evil music. Let me just see your hands. Okay. How many of you believe that there is some good or godly music? Let me see your hands. Now, where you draw the line would be different for every one of you. Typically we think, I know the music God likes. It just so happens to be the same music I like. <laughs> oh no, I, well, you can't use that cry. Don't trust your own heart, friends. Heart is desperately wicked. I'll admit to you right now, there's music I like that I know God doesn't like. It, it appeals to the carnal nature. And uh, when I talk about music, you get words and music, two different things. Keep in mind, in the book of Psalms, you get 150 Psalms there. We don't know exactly what the music was that David played with most of them, because the priority was the words. A lot of the music today, you can't even tell what the words are saying. Because, <laughs> I mean, I used to listen real hard when rock first started because they said, oh, what is that? What did he say? What does that mean? I wanted to try to buy into it. I couldn't even understand it. When I was a hippie, I couldn't understand it. And that's back when they were still legible a little bit. 
But today, it's like, and you go, what? All you hear is this syncopated, you know, when they go down the street, and the store windows are going in and out, and it has nothing to do with message, it's volume, that's the message. It puts everybody in this hypnotic state. And can you picture Jesus going down the street? <laughs> well, that, that, really, I mean, you have to ask yourself, would he listen to that? Now, I think most of the people would say, well, yeah, I know the typical, you know, that hard, violent rock and roll. Yeah, that's probably not good. That diabolical stuff where they dress up like the devil. Yeah, that's probably not good. But uh, what about the Beatles? What about my favorite songs? What about... You start listening to some of the words to that stuff, and you have to say, oh, yeah. If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. I mean, it, the, the messages in some of those songs are, if it feels good, do it. Uh, that's actually the words to one of the songs. That, those are the words I remember when I was playing pool years ago. I was thinking, I was a baby Christian. I'm in a pool hall. I didn't belong there. Wasn't baptized yet. And they're playing this song. It's going, if it feels good, do it. Uh, if it feels good, do it. Uh, whatever it is. And that was the song. And I'm thinking, ah, uh, Doug, this probably isn't a good message. And with that hypnotic beat, it's probably hypnotizing me. Subliminal. <laughs> No, no, no. That's the way the devil operates. He appeals to your audio, your ears, audio nerves, and your optic nerves are the two closest to the mind. And most rock music today, especially with the videos, they got the flashing light, the fast moving, the syncopation, and it's, like, it's very blatant hypnosis. It's planting the words and the messages in those songs in your subconscious where you don't even get to screen it with your conscience anymore. And I know some of you are thinking, yeah, you're right, Doug, that's all terrible stuff. But country mu music, that must be okay. Yeah, God loves country music, right? And you listen to some of those words, and yet it might have more tame music. But, you know, the lyrics are often like, oh, I'm here in the bar getting drunk because you left me and the cat's pregnant, and then the, <laughs> the cops have died. And, and you tell, it's all kind of depressing. You know what I mean? And so you got to listen to the music. Now, let's face it. I have heard people try to amalgamate beautiful music with terrible lyrics. Frank Sinatra sings some beautiful melodies, and the words were, it's got to be me, it's got to be me, it's got to be me. Well, it's a pretty selfish song. <laughs> you know, and, and my mother was, she was a songwriter, and I heard some spectacular music on Broadway, and, and I, I've actually rewritten, I, you know, I write songs too, I've actually rewritten some melodies that I heard in the world, and I thought it's a beautiful melody, but the words are terrible. And I put Christian words to it. And vice versa, some people have then taken wicked music and they said, well, I'm going to put Christian words to it. Ah, the bridge doesn't work that way, friends. It must be godly music and godly words. That's what composed, that's the criteria that you should use. I said way too much on this subject. He has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. That's the kind of music it ought to be. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It should be elevating. Singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. And it came to pass that when an evil spirit from God was upon Saul, Saul was having problems with depression and evil spirits, he called for David to come and to play on his harp. And David took a harp and he played with his hand. Now, what do you think David played? <laughs> no, I doubt it. It says, so Saul was refreshed and he was well. And the spirit departed from him. Now use your minds, friend. If the wrong kind of, uh, I'm sorry, if the right kind of music that David played could drive away the evil spirits from Saul, then would it stand to reason to you that the wrong kind of music could open you up to evil spirits? That's right, friends. It works both ways. It does matter what you listen to. And, and you maybe never thought about this before. So as a Christian, I'm inviting you to start thinking, I want to think about what am I listening? What am I putting into my mind? That's who you end up becoming. He that says he abides in him ought himself to walk even as he walked. Say, so what would Jesus do? Would I want to be listening to this when Jesus comes? <laughs> Number, that's no, not a question yet. But he who called you is holy. He's also called you to be holy in all your conduct. It says, he that, what about the gambling? What is a Bible? Can you picture Jesus in a casino pulling a one-armed bandit? He that makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. 
Christians ought to avoid these get-rich-quick schemes. It's okay to make investments and to work hard, but so often they get caught up in trying to get rich quick and play the lottery and he wants you to work. Don't make haste to bet, get rich. The love of money is the root of all evil. While some coveted after and have erred from the faith, pierce themselves through with many sorrows. By the way, gambling is not invented to make people rich. It's invented to make the companies rich. And yet some people still fall for that. What clear-cut list does Jesus give us that we could use as a guide for watching television? Ah. If you're not sure, throw it out. The Bible says, I will set no evil thing before my eyes. A lot of evil things on television. He who walks, up, he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Some people say, I would never do that. Do it vicariously. A lot of people say, well, I, no, I'm not going to ever cheat on my spouse. But we're entertained by other people doing it. We kind of sin by proxy. I'd never murder, but sure like shoot them up move me, movies. And you can think of, what are you watching? What does it do to your values? They've noticed that as kids watch more and more TV, that there's a surge of violence, too, among the young people. The idea about the value of life is lost because it seems so cheap. It says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they that commit such things are worthy of death, not only um, do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. It's not just doing it, it's having pleasure in those that do it. Some people, like I said, they sin by proxy by watching other people commit the sins. Again, Job 31 verse 1, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why would I look upon a young woman? Should a Christian be careful what they even look at? Make a covenant with your eyes. Can we sin with our gaze? How come David sinned with Bathsheba? He was looking where he shouldn't look. It's one thing to notice. It's another thing to gaze. And uh, he kept looking. And it turned into sin and murder and adultery and all kinds of problems. It does matter what you look at, friends. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkens unto counsel is wise. He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. You've got to say, Lord, I can't even trust my heart, but I'm going to go by your word. That's to be our guide. Number 13, what solemn warnings does Jesus give us about the example and influence of our lives? But whoever shall offend one of these little ones that believes in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. And again, let no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. It's not just the decisions you make. You have an example. If you get to heaven, there will be people there probably because of your influence. Even the thief who died on the cross is probably going to see people in heaven because of his faith in the final hours of his life. And if you turn away from Jesus, there'll be people in the lake of fire who are probably there because of your influence in some way. So it's not just that you want to do God's will to save yourself for your own happiness. You are going to influence others for, for eternity. None of us lives unto himself. Someone said, no man is an island. Not only do I want to love God, I want to love my neighbor. The reason I obey God is not just for love for him, but it's my example for you. I want to be faithful. Number 14, what are Jesus' principles and conduct regarding clothing and jewelry? <laughs> I want to ask you a question, friends, before I dive off into this. Now, I'm quoting the Bible here. Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Do you want me to tell you the truth? <laughs> Does it matter about a Christian's appearance? That's what I'm talking about when I say clothing and jewelry. I'm talking about how you adorn yourself, what you wear. Does God care? Do you care what your kids wear? Fathers, do you care what your teenage daughters wear? Does it make a difference? In Revelation chapter 12 and 17, we got two women there. Those two women don't ever speak. How do we know which is the true church and which is the counterfeit? Does the Bible tell us what they're wearing? It does. Can you sometimes tell something about it? I'm not saying you judge everybody by their outward appearance. But people do look on the outside and you want to be a representative. You know what I'm saying? If I were you, don't judge people on the outside. 
God looks on the heart. But people do look on the outside, so it makes a difference what you do. See what I'm saying? There's a difference there. In like manner, first we'll start with the ladies, it applies also to men. Modest apparel. Christian clothing, that ought to be quality. You don't have to wear burlap. It ought to be durable. It ought to be tasteful. You don't need to be the first one to adopt a new fashion, and probably shouldn't be the last. You don't want to be so out of date, you're wearing the 1800 clothing. But in other words, you want to represent Jesus by what you wear, right? Shouldn't be flamboyant and trying to get everybody to look at me what I'm wearing today. Um, not with broidered hair or gold. Broidered hair doesn't mean braided. It means they used to weave gold in their hair. Broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold and putting on apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit. He, the Lord is telling us that it's not to be the outward and the wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. The adorning should begin on the inside. And by the way, the more gold you've got on the inside, the less you'll see on the outside. With the temple of God, and you are God's temple. Did it have gold? Lots of gold. Outside or inside? I was on the inside. Marble on the outside. You want to have the gold. What's valuable is on the inside. God says it's valuable to him that you represent him with modesty. I exhort you, this is, I'm, some of you have heard of the Methodist Church. The founder, John Wesley, said this. What I'm sharing with you today are Bible principles that go way back. It's in the scriptures. It's not unique to me or my church. It's what all the Christians used to teach, Protestant and Catholic. Until the last hundred years with the introduction of films in Hollywood, everything changed with the values about Christian attire and appearance and modesty. So I'm just giving you an old message. Listen to what John Wesley said. I exhort you to wear no gold or pearls or precious stones. I do not advise women to wear rings, earrings, or necklaces. It's true that these are little, very little things. Therefore, they're not worth defending. Therefore, give them up. Let them drop off. Throw them away without another word. Does that look normal? You'll be happy to know that. <laughs> that's special effects, friends. You'll be glad to know that special effects. But does that trouble you to think about something like that? That, that, that just doesn't look right, does it? You know, of all the dumb things I've done, and I really did a lot, I never did pierce myself. I never even got a tattoo, because I thought, you know, I might tattoo some girlfriend's name and get a new girlfriend that I regret it the rest of my life. And, and let's face it, any old tattoo looks like an antique map. It just all starts to bleed, and most kids regret that. And don't worry, you may have done that. God can save you, and you can go to heaven, but that's all from paganism. Your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. All of this, this jewelry and this piercing, you trace it back to Babylon, to Egypt, to Rome. You don't find this in the Bible. If you forget everything I've said, remember this. Whenever you're in doubt, do the safe thing. I am not worried that in the judgment, I'm going to stand before the Lord. And the Lord is going to say, Doug, can't let you in. Why not, Jesus? You didn't wear enough jewelry. <laughs> My brother gave me a Rolex watch years ago, beautiful gold Rolex watch. My brother was a jeweler before he died, the one who had cystic fibrosis. This is not it. This is my $19 Casio. Do you know that it tells time better than my Rolex? <laughs> that I still have, but I don't wear it. You know why? I don't want to make anyone stumble. And I'm not judging people that may be wearing a Rolex tonight, so don't look around and check everybody's watch out. <laughs> I'm not here to judge people like that. I'm just telling you about a principle. And I'm not trying to seem self-righteous. You know why? A few years ago, a lot of televangelists were, were just ridiculed by the press. They, their hypocrisy was exposed. You know what I'm talking about? They're all begging for money, found that they were living terrible lives, begging for money, driving Rolls Royces, wearing Rolexes. People were writing songs, mocking the evangelist. Someone even wrote a song, Would Jesus Wear a Rolex? Because of the, the flamboyant, the rings and the clothes and the, the platinum wigs and everything that these evangelists and their wives were wearing, the world was laughing at them because of the way they looked. They looked at Jesus, his simplicity, his holiness, his purity, his modesty. Then they looked at these supposed representatives of Jesus. And it doesn't matter whether you go from the televangelist to the Vatican. The ostentatious, flamboyant, expensive, that's not how Jesus tells us to represent him. We ought to 
When people look at you, they ought to look at who you are and not what you're wearing. They ought to notice the essence of who you are, and yet we're so preoccupied with getting our worth from what's on the outside. Now, you, you understand? I mean, you've seen me come night after night. Have I distracted you? I just try and wear normal clothes. Don't make a big issue out of it. And, uh, and again, I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm anyone's example. I'm just saying that things have gone crazy in the world right. where people just don't have any standards for Christ. And it's, you ought to be able to look at a person and say, that person looks like a Christian. It ought to be not only on the inside, but what's on the inside ought to change the outside. Does that make sense? That's what I'm saying. That's kind of a summary. And that's why you've got these two representatives in the Bible. I'm out of time, friends. Uh, you know, what did the children of Israel make their golden calf out of? Do you know? Gold. They took the jewels from the Egyptians, they passed the plate, and they made a golden calf. You know, the typical Christian church now, you could pass the plate and make a whole buffalo. <laughs> We're heading in the wrong direction. It says they broke off the earrings out of their daughters and their sons, just like a few years ago, it was just the daughters. Now it's the sons and the daughters, even in the church, isn't it? And we want to represent Jesus, friends. The whole idea is he's called us to, to holiness. He's called us to represent him. And I've got a few slides left, but I'm really out of time. I've probably said too much. I hope you come back. <laughs> Am I still your friend, though I tell you the truth? Amen. I give you scripture for these things. I haven't even given them to you all, friends. You can, I could just start flipping through a lot more scriptures here and, and give you proof texts. Uh, God told the children of Israel, break off your, your ornaments and told Jacob, bury their idols. And the, the whole thing is about surrendering to the Lord and putting God for us and not making gods out of these little things. Come now, the Lord says, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow, if you're willing and obedient. Are you willing, friends? He can make you obedient. You want to ask him together? Let's pray. Loving Lord, Father in heaven, we're thankful for the practical things you give us in your word. It's not just the mercy and the love and the forgiveness that you promise, and we praise you for that. You also give us practical information about how to conduct our lives in this wicked world so that we don't compromise and we can represent Jesus and follow him. Be with each of these dear people, Lord. Give them wisdom right now to know through the Holy Spirit how they can apply the things that we've discussed in their lives individually. Lord, we thank you for the sacred hours of this Sabbath. We just pray a double blessing on us right now. And as we go from this place, I pray we'll know that we're not leaving your presence because you promised to go with us wherever we are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.